Now, what about salt, blood pressure, and CBD? This has been an area, again, of great controversy, largely because of the surrogate endpoint story. There is no doubt that increasing blood pressure, uh, salt intake increases blood pressure. And what we've done here is, in order to do really large studies of salt and cardiovascular disease, you had to measure salt intake in a simple way. You can't do repeat 24-hour urines. So we developed a method of fasting morning urine samples, and this is a validation study with 1,083 people from 11 countries and showed a very high correlation. So it's not perfect. So, for instance, we do epidemiology with cuff blood pressure in a clinic versus outcomes. For sure, 24-hour uh, blood pressure shows you a steeper relationship, but it doesn't change the direction of the relationship. So what is plotted here are two things. One is the measured 24-hour urine excretion. This is the estimated 24-hour excretion from the single morning fasting urine, and you'll see versus blood pressure, the correlation is the same. So you can substitute a simple morning urine test for a 24-hour urine test for population studies, not to measure the salt in an individual. And we then published our first paper from the on-target study, which was a secondary prevention trial where we had first morning urine, 30,000 people, 4,700 events, and we saw a J-shaped curve. The lowest or the optimal threshold was somewhere between three and six. Above it, there was an increased mortality. Below it, there was an increased mortality. And we did everything to adjust this away, including what is called reverse confounding. And the standard way of, of uh, adjusting for reverse confounding is you remove people with cardiovascular disease, which we couldn't do in this study, but you take away the first year, the second year, because those who change their diet because of disease, you know, the effect will only be early. And in fact, you know, most people don't change their diet anyway on salt. Then we did the pure study on 102,000 people without disease, using the same method and look exactly the same relationship. And it's exactly in the same region that we are finding the lowest trough. The same thing for the composite of cardiovascular events, 3,300 events, or death from any causes, again, the same relationship, and major CBD events, the same relationship. So two independent studies, two different uh, populations, exactly the same result. And in this study, we can exclude reverse causality because we were able to exclude the 7,000 out of the 100,000 people who had cardiovascular disease. We also excluded the diabetics. The results got even stronger. So reverse causality and confounding couldn't, couldn't uh, deal with it. We then had other studies in which we had measured urine, uh, sodium, and we pooled it, and this was published last year in The Lancet. This is on 133,000 people. The first thing is we saw an association of sodium and blood pressure in hypertensives, which was twice as steep as that in non-hypertensives. So hypertension per se identifies somebody who's salt sensitive. And that is true for systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. And these slopes are identical to the literature on 24-hour uh, urine blood pressure and, and blood pressure. I mean, 24-hour urine salt and, and blood pressure. So we're getting exactly the same relationship. And when you pool the data on 133,000, you get this J-shaped curve. Now, uh, we then divided those into hypertensives, where we have 6,800 events. Here we had 10,000 events. And you will see in those above 5 grams, there is an increase in CBD risk. But below 5 grams, there is, again, an increase. And there are several studies, 21 studies on last count in the literature, that shows this and also shows an increase in the activation of the renin angiotensin system uh, that Hans Brunner showed 40 years ago. Mickey Alderman and his group again showed that from John Larag's lab. But if you take people without hypertension, you do not get this increase at the top end. You actually get the same increase at the bottom end. What does this mean? First, that only 
a level over five grams is adverse, and it's only adverse in people who are hypertensive. So if somebody is hypertensive, takes a lot of salt, makes a lot of sense to reduce it. If somebody's not hypertensive, leave them alone. Now, you'll wonder about this J-shaped curve and stop and think for a minute. Sodium is an essential part of diet. It's teleologically necessary. We all see patients with low sodium who have hypotension, and we tell them to take sodium. If you take animal models, you will see marked activation of the renin angiotensin system, both in animals and humans, at low sodium. Sodium is also important for other homeostatic factors. The first line of defense to external infection in the skin is sodium. That is why the largest part of sodium in the body is stored under the skin in the subcutaneous lymphatics. And if you take an animal model and you make a wound in one limb, but not the other limb, within one hour, the level of sodium in the injured limb doubles because increasing sodium locally at the site of injury prevents infection. So, you know, all essential nutrients have a physiological range. Too high is bad, too low is bad. Too high obesity, uh, weight is bad, too low is bad. Too high hemoglobin is bad, too low is bad. Too high thyroxine is bad, too low is bad. And you can keep on going. So why on earth do the epidemiologists think you can lower sodium all the way down to your boots and people will live forever. People have used the data from the Yanomamo Indians uh, to say the lower the sodium, the lower the blood pressure. That is true. But do you know what they mean life expectancies? 32 years. What do they die of? Not from heart disease, but from infections. So you have to look at the person as a whole. So recently, as recently as two weeks ago, the World Heart Federation, the European Society of Hypertension, and the European Public Health Association got together an independent working group. It had five Americans, five Europeans, and five people from Asia, Africa, and South America. And their report is available online in the European Heart Journal. And they concluded that it's five grams of sodium and above that is important. And the reason for this is the WHO recommends lowering sodium to 2 or 2.3 grams per day. That's completely wrong. So does the AHA. It's completely wrong. Moderate sodium intake, 3 to 5 grams, is optimal. Below 3 grams, there's uncertainty. And the only way we can deal with it is if we have randomized trials. In fact, we don't even have randomized trials above 5 grams uh, to show a reduction in cardiovascular disease. We have trials that show a reduction in blood pressure. And so they recommend adopt an overall healthy pattern, rich in foods containing potassium, fruits and vegetables with moderate intake, and don't go bananas about it. Now let's